Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the limousine disaster that occurred in 2018 near Schoharie, New York? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case, and I'll move to my analysis. Axel and Amy Steenberg lived in Amsterdam, New York. For Amy's 30th birthday, which was on October 6, 2018, the couple arranged for a limousine to take them and their friends to a brewery in Cooperstown. The size of their group was 17 people in total. The company that operated the limousine was called Prestige Limousine Services. Axel used his credit card to pay the company $1,475 to have access to the limousine from 1 to 6 p.m. The limousine was a 2001 Ford Excursion, which had been stretched 12 feet to accommodate 10 passengers. An additional eight seats were added beyond its design capacity, so it could hold up to 18 passengers. The original weight of the vehicle was about 7,000 pounds. After being stretched, it weighed about 10,000 pounds. The Ford Excursion was basically the SUV version of the Ford F-250. The driver was a 53-year-old man named Scott Lisanika. On October 6, Scott picked up the 17 passengers and departed Amsterdam around 1 p.m. The passengers added another 3,500 pounds to the vehicle. It now weighed about 13,500 pounds. To put that in perspective, my 2022 Toyota Tundra weighs about 5,500 pounds with no passengers. The excursion weighed about two and a half times as much. After traveling west on the New York State Thruway, Scott started heading south on New York State Route 30A. When he came to the intersection with New York State Route 7, he continued straight on 7 instead of turning right, which would have kept him on New York 30A. He then turned south on New York State Route 30 and headed back the same way that he came, back toward 30A. Later, a motorist who spied the excursion said the driver appeared frazzled and confused and pulled over to the shoulder with his hazard lights on. She saw him pointing to something in the distance. Scott continued on 30 toward a three-way intersection where 30 meets 30A. The same motorist who had seen the excursion pulled over now saw the excursion pass her vehicle. The engine of the Ford was almost as loud as a jet engine. The excursion reached speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour. Even though there was a stop sign at the intersection, Scott continued through without stopping. The excursion traveled into a parking lot for the Apple Barrel Country Store, which sits on the other side of Route 30, and slammed into a parked 2015 Toyota Highlander. This is a second-generation Highlander. The Highlander was propelled 72 feet and struck two pedestrians. The excursion continued another 48 feet and went into a ravine where it collided with the embankment on the far side. 20 people were killed altogether including 17 passengers in the limousine, the driver, and two pedestrians struck by the Highlander that the excursion had run into. The New York State Police and the National Transportation Safety Board investigated the collision. Here's what they found. The limousine was not taking a direct route between Amsterdam and Cooperstown. It's not clear if the driver was lost, additional stops were added, or the party simply changed their destination. The Apple Barrel Country Store may have been the new destination. There were no skid marks on the pavement anywhere near the scene. There was a long list of complaints about the performance of the brakes on that Ford excursion. One of the passengers sent a text message prior to the crash, indicating that the limousine sounded like it was going to explode because the engine was so loud. After this, another passenger texted her fiancé and indicated the brakes were burning. Prestige Limousine Services did not have a federal certificate required to operate the vehicle, which was one of the reasons it failed inspection in September of 2018, the month before the fatal collision. There were other reasons it failed as well, including a dangling brake line, defective windshield wipers, defective emergency exits, 
and the warning light for the anti-lock brakes stayed on all the time. The vehicle also failed a spot inspection in March of 2018. It was running different license plates at that time. A CDL with a passenger endorsement is required for transporting 16 or more people. Scott did have a CDL, but he did not have the passenger endorsement. Scott actually had been given tickets in the past for driving without this endorsement. He had enough points on his license so that it should have been suspended, but a clerical error allowed him to keep it. Scott had significant quantities of marijuana in his system at the time of his death. Scott's right shoe had an imprint of the brake pedal tread pattern. The shoe was severely deformed. It appears as though Scott was pushing on the brake with everything he had. It was eventually determined that the brakes did fail in that vehicle. None of the passengers were wearing seatbelts. Some of the seatbelts were not even accessible, so they could not have put them on, even if they wanted to. The man operating the limousine company was a 28-year-old professional paintball player named Naman Hussein. His father, Shahid Hussein, owned the company, but mysteriously, he had gone missing. Shahid was also an informant for the FBI and had been paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for his services. At times, his performance was questionable, and the behavior of the authorities was questionable. There may have been some situations where entrapment was involved. Shahid's status as an informant is how the family could afford to operate the limousine business as well as other small companies. Four days after the collision, Naman Hussein was arrested for criminally negligent homicide. After he posted bail, he issued a refund on Axel Steinberg's credit card for that $1,475 charge. Then he traveled to Florida to compete in a paintball competition. When the excursion failed inspection in September of 2018, a large orange and white sticker bearing the phrase out of service was placed on the windshield. The crumpled sticker was found on the front seat of Hussein's Infinity QX56 SUV. So it does not appear as though he had a lot of respect for what out of service means. In April of 2019, Hussein was indicted on 20 counts of criminally negligent homicide and 20 counts of second degree manslaughter. Under a plea agreement, he pleaded guilty to 20 counts of criminally negligent homicide. He was sentenced to 1,000 hours of community service and five years of probation. The families of the victims were outraged that Hussein was offered a plea deal that did not involve prison. Several civil suits have been filed. Hussein will not be able to plead the Fifth Amendment during those proceedings because he already pleaded guilty. Now moving to my analysis. Like many fatal transportation incidents, this collision was not caused by just one failure. Rather, there were multiple failures facilitated by several parties. Let's take a look at the items of failure here. Item number one, the limousine industry is not well regulated. They operate commercial vehicles, but sometimes the government treats them like glorified personal vehicles. They pay much more attention to other commercial vehicles, for example, tractor trailers. The Department of Transportation failed to remove the license plates from the Ford Excursion when it failed inspection, and the Department of Motor Vehicle failed to take away Scott's driver's license, even though he was over on points. Item number two, it appears as though Hussein's father was given a pass because of his FBI informant status. There were a number of mysterious occurrences prior to the collision as far as his father getting out of trouble. For example, his father owned a house in Memphis, Tennessee, which was destroyed in a fire. He managed to sell the house for $450,000 after the fire. It was just a burned out shell. He only paid about $150,000 for the house initially. Later, reporters tried to find the buyer. The individual did not appear to exist. Law enforcement may have been protecting Hussein and his family. Item number three is the condition of the excursion. The vehicle was carrying more passengers than it was designed to. The brakes were in a state of disrepair. Not all the seatbelts were accessible, and none of the passengers were wearing seatbelts. Item number four, inexplicably, the driver of the excursion continued operating the vehicle even though the brakes were burning. He could have pulled over to the side of the road before the brakes completely failed. He also could have taken the vehicle onto the side of the road when he realized the brakes failed. 
like he could have initiated a lower speed collision to avoid a high speed fatal collision. Yet he allowed the vehicle to accelerate to over 100 miles per hour as it went downhill. My guess is that his driving style played a role here. He probably drove with his foot all the way to the floor, either on the accelerator or the brake. So instead of devices that are meant to yield a continuous level of either acceleration or braking, he viewed them more like on-off buttons, either 100% on the accelerator or 100% on the brake. I would expect this driving style for a case that occurred in New York City, but this case occurred in rural upstate New York. Item number five, Hussein had the excursion serviced at two tire shops which were not authorized to work on the vehicle. He may not have known this. It appears as though the mechanics may have misrepresented their qualifications. One tire shop charged Hussein for replacing a brake master cylinder on that vehicle, but he never actually did the work. So Hussein could have been a victim here as well. He may have been deceived by that mechanic. Item number six, even though Hussein may not have been fully aware of the condition of the brakes, he did know that the vehicle was out of service. He removed the out of service sticker, crumpled it up, and threw it on the seat of his SUV. This shows that he intentionally put the vehicle back in service when he knew it was not safe to operate. I think what happened in this case is that the prosecution was worried about the brake work that was invoiced but never done. This is clearly exculpatory evidence and could have resulted in a not guilty verdict. At least with the plea deal, Hussein was convicted in connection with every victim's death. Considering that Hussein removed that out of service sticker, I think that he would have been convicted, but I can understand the hesitancy of the prosecution. They really wanted to make sure that he didn't escape with no penalty. What do I think happened in this case? I think that Hussein allowed the excursion to fall in disrepair because he was reckless and arrogant. He had contempt for the law. He certainly had enough money to keep the excursion in good operating condition. This wasn't a situation where the company was being run on a shoestring budget. Perhaps due to his father's experiences with law enforcement, like being protected by them, Hussein felt as though he could do whatever he wanted without penalty. The government played along with his desires. They never shut him down. The poor condition of the brakes combined with a terrible driver resulted in disaster. In the end, it appears as though Hussein was more right than wrong about being able to get away with anything. This was definitely a case that should have involved incarceration, yet he escaped with no prison time. Those are my thoughts on the case of the limousine disaster in New York in 2018. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.